if I've seen weirder ways to start a podcast before, but yeah, yeah, it's definitely not the weirdest. This would maybe be the weirdest. I have to keep the yawning to a minimum. I'm sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Lateral Show. Fasten your seatbelts, because here we go. That's right, ladies and germs, it's another edition of The Lateral Show, a sideways look at fantasy football. You can follow me on Twitter at HermsNFL. You can follow McLateral on Twitter a couple of different places. Uh, we got some stuff to talk about, some stuff about some wide receivers that are in the news and some wide receivers that could be some interesting sleeper waiver wire targets for you. So that's the plan for the show. Yeah, sleepers, maybe not quite the right term. You'll definitely have heard some of these names, um, but it was tough to really find a better word for it. So we're going with sleepers. Oh, yeah. so, you know what? A lot of these terms are fairly arbitrary in the grand scheme of things anyway. I feel as though a lot of that's been bastardized. You know, what is yeah. a sleeper at this point? What is a breakout? You know? Yeah. On the subject of sleepers, uh, apologies for the Casper mattress box behind me. I uh, haven't had time to set that up, so it's in the show. Um, not moving. Could be a sponsor. Not official yet. You never know. You yeah, know no this ads. is our olive branch. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, maybe maybe I should just take advantage of this moment to uh, get on my soapbox. Because yeah, go for we it. We have something to celebrate, and that is, of course, the Phillies are in the NLCS. Let's oh, crack that open. <laughs> Delicious. But no, actually, seriously, what we're here to celebrate is you have a new job, and it is awesome, and it is a dream accomplished, and I just want to say congratulations. Well, thank you. Yes, we are we are recording this show on what is technically supposed to be my dinner break, uh, as I am now, uh, what is my official title? Uh, Associate NFL Editor at Clutch Points. Yes, big... Uh, Big time into the basketball coverage. You know, they've been doing that for a long time. But over the recent years, they've been expanding their coverage into other sports. And I was lucky enough to be part of the football team. So, yeah, I get to do I get to do some football stuff. Well, congrats, man. Uh, uh, that is all I've got. So over to you as I try and finish this beer over the course of your dinner break. There you go. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I... I don't really have a whole heck of a lot other than to say it's nice when life gives you chances to uh, make up for, you know, either wrongdoing or just like, you know, things that didn't really work out the way you wanted them to because John Mulaney announced that he is adding a date to his uh, stand-up tour and I missed the show of his over the summer in DC because I was busy working but now I get to go see him in Baltimore on a day off on a Saturday which is way more convenient than the show that I had tickets for over the summer so thank you life for giving me a second chance to remedy this no, I get to go I, see John Mulaney soon <laughs> I, de I definitely get that I remember a couple years ago I had tickets to see Royal Blood at the 930 Club as a headliner, and I was so stoked. And then I got so sick, uh, so I was not able to go. Yeah. But life finds a way, and Royal Blood then announced that they were going on tour with my favorite band, Queens of the Stone Age. So I got to see them and Queens of the Stone Age twice. Went to Philly, saw them. Went to D.C., saw them. It was a great time. So life does have a funny way of working out like that. It really does. It really does. And you never know what's going to happen, especially when it comes to wide receivers in the NFL that are in the news for certain things. Boom. Yeah. Segway. Look at that. See, look at that. That's why they pay well, me the big it, bucks. It would, it would be a segue if we still didn't have to go and recap uh, last show's stories. Well, see, well, <sighs> I kind of figured they're, since they're we in the missed notes, Herms. a whole they're in week. in the notes. 
Yeah. Oh, so, oh yeah, by the way, uh, this is the first time you're hearing us in quite some time, because I was sick for all of last week with a fever of 104, went to the doctor, they never figured it out. I didn't get prescribed any sort of, uh, what do they call those, antibiotics or nothing? So I was uh, going to say medicines, but yeah, yeah, that's a little more specific, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. What what um, did we talk about two weeks ago? Well, let's let's see if I can run it all down in sixty seconds. Okay, the all right, here clock we go. Starts now. So our week five stories we had Herms talking about how to attack Arby's going forward, and I talked about how you can't really fix your team through waivers this season. Uh, regarding Herms' story, week five through six, Brees Hall RB three, Ramondre Stevenson RB five, Deion Jackson RB eight. Admittedly, a handcuff. But Jonathan Taylor, also on a rookie deal, because you'll see where I'm going here. Saquon Barkley, RB9, Kenneth Walker, the third, RB10, and Josh Jacobs, RB11. They're all on their rookie deals. This is what we are telling you. You got to focus on these young guys if you want to succeed and don't like overdo it with guys that are aging assets. Also, with my story, uh, still largely true, but the wide receivers are starting to break through, as we'll talk about later this episode. Finally, my week six storyline was going to be that maybe we can't play Jalen Waddle without Tua. Uh, he went ahead and then answered that, got 10 targets, and was totally fine. So that is that. And then on to the wide receiver bonanza starting now. Yes, and my topic last week was too bad. I'm sick. Haha. <laughs> and update on that is we're doing this now. Wide receivers in the news, bonanza all around. Oh. <laughs> okay, we start. With the uh, so, so I wrote an article about this player over at footballabsurdity.com, uh, not knowing that what less than three hours after it being published that they would be requesting a trade from their team. So, as anybody who plays fantasy football this year knows, Elijah Moore of the New York Jets not doing so hot. Not doing so hot. I break down some of the reasons why. Some of it kind of has to do with the fact that he's never really built a lot of chemistry with Zach Wilson, but it doesn't stop there. You know, them adding Brees Hall to the offense, you know, made for a larger share of the targets being funneled to the running backs. Garrett Wilson came in, took some of the work away. But regardless, he has another quiet game on Sunday. He's a little frustrated, and they're just like, okay, well, we're going to have to figure something out here. And now Elijah Moore wants out. So, I mean, I think just based off of everything that I said and included in my article, which you can check out on my Twitter page at Herms NFL. Woohoo. Do you care if he stays or goes? I mean, I think we don't I would personally it. love it if he goes. Yeah. Um cuz and I think you talked about his chemistry with Zach Wilson. I think the issue is Zach Wilson's not very good. So, yes, he's struggling with tar car the target competition. There's Brees Hall. There's Michael Carter. There's Tyler Conklin. There's Garrett Wilson. There's Corey Davis. It's a fairly big list. There's a lot of talent on this Jets. A place where there isn't talent is quarterback Zach Wilson, where Elijah Moore had seven targets per game in the three games with that Zach, without Zach Wilson this season. Less than three targets per game since Zach Wilson came back in week four. Plus, the target quality is awful. According to Player Profiler, Elijah Moore is 98th in target quality and 96th in true catch rate. Ouch. He's also 16th in unrealized air yards. So there's a lot of opportunity that's just going to the wayside when it comes to Elijah Moore. I'd personally love to see him go to the Los Angeles Rams. Unfortunately, I don't think they have the draft capital to get him unless the Jets not. are yeah. willing to take some picks pretty far down the line. Admittedly, we know the Rams would be willing to give up those picks. Um, but I just think a guy like Matthew Stafford, where you can just air it downfield to more, let more do his thing. I think Cup and more would be a pretty elite wide receiver duo <laughs> as well so there's a lot to like about that unfortunately i just don't see it happening especially given that the jets will have probably zero interest in cam Akers, who's also requested a trade recently um where do you yeah. think you'd like more to go uh i got a couple destinations in mind that could be pretty fun but just to add some more context for our uh for our viewers uh, how, do, how do you like them apples? I did. Uh, I included a little split courtesy right. of uh, Rotoviz of I like games. It. Yeah, so, with and without Zach Wilson. If you take a look at that, the PPR points per game <laughs> goes from about fifteen and a half all the way down to a little less than like seven and a half. So not so great. The, Bob. the, the in not split great. is with Zach Wilson. The out of split is without Zach Wilson. That is the case yeah. indeed. 
Cool. I don't know if that includes Sundays. Just slightly game. covering something, so that's why I wanted to check. That is true. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't know if that includes this past Sunday's game because I, I kind of pulled this and started working on the article. I'll be honest; Monday, it, it so. still it still paints a pretty significant disparity. I, I yeah. think you'll be okay without the game where Zach Wilson uh, successfully targeted Elijah Moore zero times. Yeah. So you know that's. Uh, that's that's about all that you need to know there. I think it's especially tough when it comes to receivers like this that are like obviously so talented and have so much like team control left. Cuz I mean is he's the, not taken a step back talent wise. It's not like all of a sudden we're just like, oh man, like Elijah Moore's really lost it. He oh looks yeah, as yeah. good as ever. Yeah. Nothing on the field is indicating and like, yeah, this guy has no clue what's going on. You know, it's not like a Dante Pettis type situation. You know, not to single anybody out and pick Too on them, soon. but like, I'm just saying. But you know, I'm right. You know, uh, I'm not ready to talk about Dante Pettis. I would never be ready to talk about Dante Pettis. Here with the Niners, man. Like I was like, this boy knows how to ball, and then it seems he just forgot what football was. But I don't know, like the place that I would like to see more go ties in too much into the next receiver I have to talk about. So I will use that as a little bit of a teaser and also maybe perhaps say, would you rather between these two going to support Aaron Rodgers? Okay, that that makes more sense, because I thought you were about to say that this guy was going to go to the team replacing the other guy. And I'm just oh, like, well, no. that defeats the purpose of trading the other guy. Yeah. I I think I actually prefer Chase Claypool oh. going to the Packers and joining Aaron Rodgers. And I think it's largely due to usage. Claypool being a pretty good fit in Green Bay. And me just thinking there's better Elijah Moore landing spots. Like, I think Claypool would be, like, perfect for Aaron Rodgers. I think Moore would still be an insanely talented wide receiver for Aaron Rodgers. You'd probably make it work. But, again, like, I just, like, to me, the perfect fit for him is the Rams or something very, very like that. You know, Tampa Bay yeah. would obviously be another good one. But, obviously, again, they really can't trade for him. You know, it just somewhere – the Saints would actually honestly be pretty good for Elijah Moore if they were able to have him running alongside Chris Lave, but like Claypool, I want him to go to green Bay. That is exactly where I would like him to go. So for those of you who are wondering, Hey, why the hell are these guys talking about chase Claypool going to green Bay? Uh, Jeremy Fowler over at ESPN put out an article a few days ago talking about some interesting, you know, kind of trade rumblings that he's been hearing about throughout the league. Uh, Kendrick Bourne is another receiver that could potentially be on the move. That's not nearly as interesting, not but quite, uh, no, no <laughs> not, not quite to that level. Uh, some of the Giants receivers, uh, namely Kadarius Tony, that's another one that could be pretty interesting. I kind of just have to mention all these guys just out of fairness because there is some intrigue, sure. there. but Re real quick, if instead of Chase Claypool or Elijah Moore, or even Kadarius Tony the Packers trade for Kendrick Bourne. Do you think Rodgers immediately retires or waits five seconds and then rage quits? I think with the kind of weirdo shit that he's been on recently, what he would try and do, at least at the beginning, is replace himself with a cardboard cutout of himself, see how long it takes for them to notice that it's not actually him, and then he will show up in disguise with somebody else in an effort to reanimate the cardboard version of Aaron Rodgers, fail, and then everybody packs up and there's a pretend funeral. That's probably where I'm going with it. But, you know, that's just me. He would it probably just go the way most out. Packery move <laughs> to like, here are these elite wide receiver talents available. We're going to get Kendrick Bourne, who's fine, but like we've had plenty of fine on this roster. Yeah, it, it would be very Packers of them. But I was definitely interested to see Claypool's name pop up in this connected with Green Bay. And, you know, even just well-established Steelers fan on the podcast. Uh, you know, they've been getting him a lot more involved in the last couple of weeks. Maybe it's a bit of a showcase situation because 
you know, as, as long as Kenny Pickett has, you know, seen some game action, it's pretty clear. Not that they don't need Claypool per se, but he is a, a touch superfluous with the connection that Pickett feels with fellow rookie George Pickens. And the fact that as long as Pat Fryermuth is healthy, I mean, he's got a pretty healthy dose of involvement. Deontay Johnson is still going to be around. I mean, it's a team that I root for that needs a lot of help in a lot of different places. And if you could get some draft capital from Green Bay for a guy like this, everybody wins in this situation. Like, I, I would rather see Elijah Moore, personally, if I'm picking between the two, to go help Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay just because I feel like Elijah Moore is a bit more of that type of smaller, twitchy receiver that Aaron Rodgers has historically done very well with. Oh, and see, I want I want the big body. I want the dude that just can run down the field and just like moss a guy. Yeah, so Claypool can't really do that that well. It would just it would be like as a hey, we gave you Alan Lazard. Let's give you a better Alan Lazard, but by how much? Shrug. Like, you know, we've seen Rogers work with those guys, the Jory Nelsons, the Randall Cobbs. And also, let's be honest, the type of receiver that Devonta Adams is. You know, he's out there doing, you know, it's like, oh, like those cuts that he makes, it's surgical, absolutely insane. But I don't know. Both would be good, better than what they have. (laughs) Yeah, especially, um, boy, when we talked about Christian Watson's drop issues, uh, we were not exaggerating. He's like, is is it too early to say he's kind of toast as long as Rodgers is quarterback? We're not even halfway through the man's rookie career. I want to give him some time. I get but, that, but you know, Rodgers has seemingly had zero inclination to throw to him. He's never really had much of an inclination to throw to rookie receivers at all, but the point stands, with there not being that many receiving options, you would hope that, you know, I'd, oh, I mean, he's God. literally targeted the other rookie receiver, I think, significantly more, and significantly more impactfully. Then he's targeted Watson so far. Yeah, this Romeo season. Dubs, baby. Whoa, yeah. Dude, out here in these streets doing his thing. I'm really proud of that guy. He's been very good. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. So just between the two, Elijah Moore, Chase Claypool, kind of wrapping it up before I send it over to you for your topic. Which receiver of the two do you feel has the biggest fantasy impact, regardless of where they go? And then if you have some thoughts about some of the fallout that would happen from their departures on the Jets or the Steelers have at it. So I would say regardless of where they go, Claypool will have more of an impact. Cause I think so like Kate Claypool currently is fit number 15 in deep targets, number nine in target quality rating and number five in catchable target rate, mm-hmm. but he's just 74th in yards per target because his target accuracy is an awful, like 57th best in the league so like he's already starting to make he's already kind of making the most of a bad situation in pittsburgh and so in Uh theory it should only go up from there and then if he does go somewhere like green bay then like sky's the limit so i he just has such a more comfortable floor than elijah moore i think elijah moore has the higher ceiling for sure yeah i just think like you we saw the splits here between him being with zach wilson and not being with zach wilson the like floor is literally zero. I mean, we saw it this past week and I think with Claypool, I mean, Claypool's had some bad weeks this season, but I think we're kind of turning a corner there and it's just, I think it's such a higher floor. So if it's regardless of what happens, I'd have to go with Claypool. I think Elijah Moore is the better ceiling play of the two. I don't think Elijah Moore gets traded though. I think Claypool has a really good chance of being traded. I don't think Elijah Moore gets traded. Um, and so kind of because of that, I don't think there's going to be really any fallout in Pittsburgh. Claypool's clashed with the Pittsburgh hierarchy at times, like more than once. That is so true. I don't know that a ton of I don't know how many people are necessarily going to be glad to see him go, but I think the number of people who are going to be sad to see him go is going to be pretty low. So I don't think it's going to make that big of a difference. I think Elijah Moore, if they lose an elite wide receiver talent that they took with a day two pick only two years ago. I think, you know, to say that they won't bounce back is too drastic, but this is going to have a 
non-zero impact on that team. This will affect chemistry. I think Elijah Moore is well liked enough, uh, and it will it will add to the significant questions we already have about Zach Wilson. Bingo. Yeah, I mean, like that's kind of that's like the biggest takeaway of I think the entire thing between these two stories. Because I mean, I mean, like you said, Pittsburgh doesn't really change a whole lot. I mean, if anything, it's like woohoo, more George Pickens time, yay! But I mean, that was the plan by drafting him all along anyway. So. Yeah, like the uh, well established in the history of the lateral show, how we feel about Zach Wilson. Not exactly like, you know, I, I didn't understand it at the time, the whole, because I remember there was the whole thing, be, and maybe it was just smoke screens going around draft time just to kind of confuse people and, you know, add some helium to players' values, but like anonymous executives comparing Zach Wilson to a young Patrick Mahomes. And I'm like, what are you people talking yeah. about? <laughs> His tape isn't particularly Mahomesian. Like it's Mahomesian in the way that it's like, look, he can get outside the pocket and throw while he's kind of running. But so a lot of him. quarterbacks can yeah. do that. So like it. Ugh. No, I mean, I watched his tape coming out of college and he looked like a guy who couldn't make a second read. And in the NFL, he's struggling to make his first. Um, I actually, on this subject, I heard a really interesting take cool. listening to, I want to say Slow News Day with Kevin Clark. And it was that some of these rookie quarterbacks struggled to a degree because if you go to really good schools, you end up with a lot of elite wide receiver talent. It was more in like line with the uh, Alabama quarterbacks. You know, right. I think this doesn't yeah. quite apply to Zach Wilson, but. You know, Joe Burrow had a ton of talent at LSU. Tua had a ton of talent at Bama. Justin Jalen Fields Hurts had right a ton now. of talent at Bama. Justin Fields was definitely someone they brought <laughs> up, had a ton of talent. And so they are, like, we talk about how, like, the Jacksonville Jaguars, when they were the lack of stock of the league, could still beat, like, the best college team because, like, the pro teams are made of literally all the best college players getting drafted onto one team. But the thing was, for some of these schools – like all their wide receivers were like day one guys mm -hmm. and not all the defense they, they were playing were day one guys. In fact, they were often lots of undrafted guys, guys who didn't even make it into the league. And so now all of a sudden they are playing against defenses filled with people who were the best in college, something they didn't go up against every week. And that's why you see some of those struggles. And I thought it was an interesting point. So, again, I don't think it quite applies to Zach Wilson, given that he now has more wide receiver talent at New York than he ever did at BYU. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, but just talking about a guy on his rookie deal like that made me think of it. It was just, like, interesting food for thought. I thought it had some merit. It's one of those things that, like, I think we all, in the back of our minds, like, just, like, we passive, like, passively acknowledge that but do not often like carry that to the forefront and realize like there are 32 college all-star teams <laughs> across. <laughs> like, yeah. That's what this is. Yeah. It's you know? literally the and, best of the best. Yeah. Especially like when you get to those, you know, kind of like quote unquote mid-major program guys like a Zach Wilson, like, yeah, I mean, like, it's true for those big school guys, the whole list that you mentioned, but even the further down you go, not only the people they're working with, but the people they're playing against, like all around, it's a bunch of people who maybe never reached that level. So food for thought for sure. It's one of the beautiful things about the lateral show. Um, uh, real quick before I turn it over to you, uh, better with the ambiguity in Dynasty, Chase Claypool, Elijah Moore. Boom. Still going to bet on Elijah Moore's talent. I, th I think in Dynasty, I'm still going to bet on Elijah Moore's talent. I feel the same way. Still young enough. Still some interesting yeah. appeal there, but because he there. should either figure out how to turn it around, the Jets will go. Zach Wilson is not the answer, or he will get traded. I don't think he gets traded during this season, but like if this is still this big of a problem, he could be an off-season trade candidate. Yeah, you never know. So keep an eye on that, folks. All sorts of interesting things floating around. Remember, the NFL trade deadline is on November 1st. So between now and then, we'll have to see. You've got some interesting receivers that you would like to talk about that are not necessarily the subject of trade rumors at all. We're just talking about them for fantasy purposes. No, and in fact, I can guarantee you 
that none of these guys are currently part of trade rumors. I can I can guarantee that. Um, the first guy, so these are my wide receiver sleeper targets. These are guys you need to be looking at. They are available on waivers still, though for a couple of these guys, that possibility is going down less and less. You probably should have looked at them last week, including Alec Pierce, who I wrote about in last week's heat check, told you, you need to get this guy. Uh, he needs to be 100% rostered. Like since Okay, so since week four, he and Michael Pittman Jr. have started every game. They have also produced nearly the same amount of fantasy points. Pierce is actually the higher producer. He's wide receiver 17 with 11.5 points per game in PPR formats. Pittman Jr., wide receiver 18 with 11 points per game in PPR formats. The targets for Pierce have been consistent. The quality has been good. And as I mentioned in the heat check, the Colts pass a lot. They like pass a lot, which is surprising. We think of them as a very run heavy team but they as of last week's heat check threw the ball the seventh most times of anyone in the league you know so there's a lot of opportunity for pierce he's making the most of it and i don't think he lets go of his role as the number two wide receiver despite the fact that paris campbell got some targets last week which i just don't care about i actually like don't care about paris campbell getting targets at all i finally gave up on that (laughs) um Unfortunately, I dropped Alec Pierce in one league because of this next guy. But first, Herms, I would like to get your thoughts on Alec Pierce. I'm a big fan of this call. You know, I did put out a uh, little bit of a tweet thread earlier today about some guys that are broadly available, specifically on ESPN leagues. And the headliner of that was Pierce. Uh, some interesting numbers that I pulled as part of that. Uh, 26.4% air yard share leads the Colts. It's like it's he's not. You would think that Michael Pittman Jr. would be leading in the air yard share, but like, nah, that's Pierce, man. And their next couple games against the Titans and the Commanders are against uh, teams. It's uh, both of them top 10 in fantasy points per game allowed to the wide receivers i checked that out through pro football reference i think the DraftKings scoring is how you get the ppr points so yeah think about that the next couple games yeah. man well, i think it's whichever one's all the way at the end yeah so you know like two primo matchups he's already been killing it and he is the like the air yard monster for the colts like what's not to like i was not sure how good he would be in his rookie season. I mean, he was an interesting prospect at Cincinnati, but like, boy, man, I feel pretty stupid for not taking him in like any of my rookie drafts. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty I was pretty hyped on him. I tried to trade to be able to draft him and it just didn't quite work for me. Um, but yeah, I think a couple things to keep in mind. Uh, as of when I wrote the heat check last week, mm-hmm. he had the 13th best target quality rating according to player profiler. Ooh. So, I think something we have to bear in mind for fantasy football is that Michael Pittman draws more attention on defense and it opens up a lot of opportunity for Alec Pierce to get much better coverage and much better targets. Um, But here's the other thing over the past two weeks, again, prior to last week, week six, he had actually seen as many targets as Michael Pittman jr. In each game, if not more targets than Michael Pittman jr. In those games. So, Matt Ryan has no problem throwing to him again. I really think he is a guy that needs to be 100% rostered in leagues at this point. Unless, obviously, with the caveat, and the caveat kind of goes for all these guys, if you have a really shallow roster construction or blah, 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 like, you know your roster better than we do. Just if thinking as a traditional 12-team league with traditional ESPN or Yahoo formats, like, you need to have this guy. Mm -hmm. Uh, And... I think you need to have Wandale Robinson hey. in, in our home league. I had Alec Pierce and then I dropped out Alec Pierce and picked up Wandale Robinson. Um, and I like a slight tinge of regret, but Wandale, I still think we saw enough from him to make me excited. So my biggest concern with Wandale Robinson is honestly the Giants offense, which is not the prettiest. A lot of it goes through Saquon Barkley and 
much like our concerns with the Jets offense with Zach Wilson, their concerns with the Giants offense with Daniel Jones, who not great at quarterback, though definitely better than Zach Wilson. Um, yeah. Low bar. So you know. for me, this is a ceiling <laughs> play. So Robinson got injured in week one. He only came back last week against the Ravens. But I think Robinson has the role to take the wide receiver one or wide receiver two role in their depth chart. And no, he will never be a traditional X, but the X wide receiver isn't always the best for the Giants. So far this season, the top two Giants wide receivers have been Sterling Shepard, slot, and Richie James, slot. Brian Rondo Dibble, Robinson baby. also plays slot. And he can definitely beat out Richie James for that role as Richie James has been beat out for roles numerous times already in his NFL career. Like, we've seen it happen. It's not exactly a shock if it does. And Cole Beasley excelled in the slot in a Brian Dable offense, as you point out. Like, he exceeded multiple times for the Bills offense with Brian Dable calling the shots. And then he only saw a 23% snap share in Week 6, but still brought in three or four targets for 37 yards and a touchdown. Shows clear room for growth. The fact that he's like not even on the field a quarter of the time. And then this first week back from injury. So that feels very intentional. You know, they're like, obviously you can't just simply extrapolate. Well, if he gets on the field hundred percent of the time, that means he'll go nine for 12. And like, you know, obviously that's sure. not how it works, but there's clearly a ton of opportunity here for Wandale Robinson. He honestly could be for the giants. So we hoped Rondale more would be for the Cardinals. Except I never believed him more, and I kind of believe in Robinson's playmaking ability. So again, to me, he is a must roster. If you go with Pierce over Robinson, I'm not going to judge you harshly, but I think Robinson is the better ceiling play. And so for me, he's the one I want more on my rosters, but only just slightly. You know, and to go with what you were talking about, you know, a very small amount of the snaps in the first game back, but a 16% target share and 21.4% air yard share in week six in your first game back. Those are numbers that you can look at and ride with. Like that's the really impressive thing to me is that, you know, you put the man out doing his thing. IR, you take your time there, young man, immediately come back. Bloop, boom. Just like, dude, like right out the gate. It's such an ambiguous situation in New York, because as we talked about a little bit earlier about some of those, you know, trade rumor guys, like who knows what happens with Kadarius Tony? Like Kenny Galladay's not going anywhere, obviously. But you know, I mean, I think I mentioned or I saw mentioned Darius Slayton's name in the article. So like, so many. Di- this is the perfect time for somebody like a Wandale Robinson to just waltz in and seize the role. Like, hey guys, fantasy points, yeah, give me her, because a system predicated around feeding Saquon Barkley and only feeding Saquon Barkley is not going to sustain itself, especially with how good, I guess, to some degree, maybe lucky the giants have been this year. Like they are still very much in line to potentially win the division in the NFC East this year. Their record is shockingly good compared to how we thought this team was going to be. So it would and I think they us. will remain at least good. Like, I think the Eagles are still clearly the team to beat. Yes. And frankly, Dallas might actually be a bit better than the Giants. But I don't think there's a huge gap necessarily between the two. It's wild to say, but I mean, like, this is what's happened. This is the information that we have. And the information tells us the Giants, pretty good. That's, I mean, I, we all kind of figured, we all being just football fans, that at some point Brian Dable was going to be able to, you know, get himself a nice gig away from Buffalo, go somewhere, coach something up. I thought he would have a lot better time next year with a quarterback that wasn't Daniel Jones. But hey, sometimes you waltz in, get immediate results, which to me, honestly, if they end up making the playoffs, I don't even care if it's just a wild card team. They don't even have to win the division for this to happen. I'd give that man coach of the year. I really would. Just like your rookie coaching effort and taking a team like this to potentially heights that great. He's my early candidate, man. (laughs) Yeah, I think you might be right there. I'm like, I'm trying to think of 
who else it would be? I mean, we know it's not Nathaniel Hackett. No. <laughs> um, you know, I think the other one would be like if Doug Peterson did something similar. But at the moment, while the Jags certainly look way more respectable than they did last year, seems like playoffs are probably a bit far out of reach. So, yeah, uh, Brian Dable for coach of the year. I don't think that's a crazy take to have. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> we can clip it. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Clip this out. We'll put it on. Put it on the internet. See what people have to say. Uh, <laughs> Give me pictures of Spider Man. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so that's uh, that's not the only uh, other receiver that you have. You got uh, you got some I've other got ones one you more. want to tell me about. I, All right, cool. I got one more. And uh, real quick, I'm gonna go ahead and see how he's doing because it's Robbie Anderson. So again, I said there's no one who's currently in trade rumors because there are no more rumors. He's gone. That is true. Uh, everyone is saw true. Robbie Anderson got his ass benched, thrown out, and then traded within like 24 hours. It has been a absolute roller coaster. So here's the thing. I don't love Robbie. I think he's been merc mercurial at best. Um, but with Hollywood Brown out, he has some opportunity. I think Arizona can support multiple wide receivers. They've clearly done it in the past. They've done it this season. I mean, we saw Greg Dortch do well. Yeah. Now, granted, will they have the same role? Probably not. You know, no. that, that, Robbie's not a slot. Um, but I think Rondale Moore is the slot, and I think his chances to take over the depth chart are pretty much gone. Obviously, everyone could get injured, or he could have a phenomenal breakout game, and then all of a sudden, maybe they're finding ways to work him in. But I think at the moment, He's a break glass in case of emergency option if all of a sudden a defense has completely shut down everything else, uh, which if you watched tonight's game, uh, the New Orleans defense did not shut down anything. Uh, it's been quite quite a, uh, quite a rough game for them. Oh, um, yeah. So that means Robbie can take A.J. Green's role because I don't think A.J. Green has a tough lock on it. I think the trade was largely due to the Hollywood Brown injury, but I think AJ Green's lackluster performance has had a bit to do with it. Sure. And I think, frankly, the cheap cost of acquiring Robbie Anderson also had a bit to do with it. Also so helpful. he could really take the role opposite DeAndre Hopkins, be the second option ahead of Rondale Moore. And like we've seen Robbie Anderson still do it this season. In week one, he went five for eight. 102 yards, one of which would a lot of which was a 75 yard touchdown from Baker Mayfield. So, like with Kyler Murray throwing him the ball, like, yeah, he can still do it. He physically has what it takes. It's all about the mentals. Now, the <laughs> bad news when Hollywood Brown comes back, Anderson will become a bench or rotation guy. Like, he will be the backup. He'll maybe come out, you know, four or five wide receiver sets if they need to give Hopkins or Brown like a playoff or something, they'll throw him in there. So it's not a long-term solution, but until then he's got potential. I wouldn't let me, let me check real quick to see right. here what he's done tonight. Cause I know they said they were going to keep him incredibly limited. So I don't even know if he's really done anything. There's only one way to find out. That's why we got it our is. handy dandy research tools via the internet. So he has zero receptions for zero yards. Uh, there I'm you go. He has a target since he's on the stat list here. I'm going off of Google. That's the reason I can't actually see it. They don't give me that metric, uh, but it was easier than diving through ESPN and all that stuff. Um, but again, that doesn't worry me. What I want to see is next week against the Vikings. If he pops off there, he's worth keeping on your roster. If he doesn't, he's not going to do it. You should cut him. It won't be worth the headache. And regardless, I'd still rather have Pierce or Robinson. Like there is those guys and then there's Robbie Anderson. But if you're in deeper leagues or if all of a sudden the like wide receiver depth on your waiver wires has gone kind of dry, I think he is someone that you can stash, keep an eye on and see what he does next week. I mean, you never know. I mean, I, I think with, <laughs> With how much of the Arizona offense does funnel through not only the slot, but also Zach Ertz, the tight end, Anderson at best is fighting to be the 3A to someone's 3B 
as far as the pecking order. But with an offense that likes to throw as much as the Arizona Cardinals do, you never know when those types of things are going to pay off, which is why he could probably be a flex consideration, or especially for people to play in those three wide receiver leagues, consideration there definitely for sure. And, you know, I think, because like you were kind of saying, you know, as long as Hollywood is out, I think – what is it like six weeks or so is about what they say about that. But then there's also the four process is what I'm hearing. Yeah. So anywhere from four to six, but then he also kind of has to ramp himself back up. So you got to bake in maybe a couple weeks there. Probably they're probably going to keep those snap shares a little bit low to, you know, begin with. So, you know, it it's, it's a short term thing in like the grand scheme of things, but as far as the remainder of the fantasy season, I mean, like that's a pretty long time that you could get some useful, you know, production out of somebody like Robbie Anderson. I, like you, will be definitely interested in seeing what he does next week once he's had a little bit more time to acclimate with his new team. Yeah, and again, to, to put it yeah. in perspective, I, I pulled up the ESPN stuff while you're talking. So he's only got the one target. Again, uh -huh. we're That's expecting one. him to be really limited today. <laughs> but if you look at Cardinals wide receivers not named DeAndre Hopkins, the leader in targets is Rondale Moore with two. There is so much opportunity potentially in this offense. And if Robbie Anderson is willing to play ball, like we know he doesn't have any injury issues, there's a chance that he could take over some of that available. I mean, again, vacated targets not really being a thing, but like Robbie Anderson has also proven that he can earn more than one target typically in an NFL game. Yeah. So I mean, I'm not going to take too much there. away from this one, you know, but yeah, yeah. The point stands. Yeah. The point Again, I I uh, I think you should take nothing away from this one. <laughs> but what I'm saying is what you can take away is the workload they're giving to wide receivers not named DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah. Which is basically none. That is true. That is very true. That's it. That's all, that's all I got. Those are my wide receiver sleepers. Well, there you go. See, I thought that was a pretty good exercise. You know, so now we get, you know, toward the later part of the show, which comes with an awkward ad read from me. All right, do you like doing stuff with, with prop fix? Because if you do, <laughs> do you, you like should, doing stuff? You well, should, do you? You, oh. should, you should sign up for Thrive Fantasy using promo code HERMS for a 100% match on your first deposit up to $100. That means if you put down $2, you will be given two dollars if you put down five dollars. You will be given five dollars if you put down ten. You will be given ten, etc., etc. Using promo code Herms on Thrive Fantasy. That is the thing that I'm plugging. Also, fun fact. Okay, so we got some premium stuff at FantasySixPack.net, including uh, the uh, fancy portion of my waiver wire article. On top of all sorts of things, you know, like there's a whole Discord community, award-winning rankings, DFS tools. You can't get any of that without going to fantasysixpack.net slash plans, folks. You got to go to fantasysixpack.net slash plans to get the all-access pass to the fancy shit that's on the website that's pretty cool. So if you think about it, you're getting like, what, my article, DFS tools, rankings, uh, all the Discord. That's four things, okay? That's four good things for one thing that you have to do, which is give us money. So I'm just saying. something. And even if you about. don't give us money, you still get my fantasy football heat check article where I take a look at a bunch of sleepers each That's week. That's true. Uh, and it has been paying dividends, like – these guys are all rostered in less than 50% of leagues. That means they are pretty widely available. And I think I've actually hit on more than not this season. So definitely make sure you're continuing to look at that. Absolutely. 100%, man. 100%. Uh, oof. Well, I mean, I think that's, uh, I think that's about Boom all bust. we have planned. Boom Out. Bust. Right. That is a segment of the show that we do. Uh, yes, our boom bust picks. Something that I am incredibly prepared for, as is extremely evident by the way that I'm talking very much like a normal person well, right now. Luckily for that you, is... <laughs> while you vamp, I can actually give my boom bust picks. Let's go. Because I was able to look this up while you were talking earlier about stuff, because uh, I was also super prepared. Uh, I do <laughs> actually have some seriously excellent boom bust picks this week. Uh, bust, David Montgomery. Chicago Bears currently projected to be uh, the half PPR RB21 
Thank you for updating Fantasy Pros. The PPR RB20, he's got a terrible matchup against the New England Patriots, who checks notes are the third most difficult run defense in the league when it comes to uh, allowing fantasy points to running backs. You basically can't get a tougher matchup than this. And David Montgomery is not an elite running back. So I would stay away. Again, ECR is not crazy on him, but they're still considering him a starter. And I would not start him, period, the end. I think you have some better options, unless you obviously don't. You know what your roster is. But, for example, Brian Robinson Jr., RB28, I would play him over David Montgomery this week. But Brian Robinson Jr. is not my boom pick. No, no, no. My boom pick this week, checks notes again to make sure, thank you, this one is on PPR, is actually a guy we've talked about today, and that is Wandale Robinson. Yeah! Wandale Robinson is all the way down at wide receiver 48, so he's barely a wide receiver four, according to the experts. I think he's actually got potential to be a starter, which would be top 36. Um, You know, Jacksonville, solid matchup, especially for the not primary wide receiver. And so, you know, like, again, they're the 14th best matchup, so top half of the league. He's not the primary wide receiver, so he won't necessarily be guaranteed shadow coverage or anything like that. I think that his 9.4 points and his wide receiver 48 ranking are just simply too low, and I do expect him to finish as a fantasy starter this week. There you go. Bing bong. We got the picks. We got some from your boy Herms here, too. Uh, My boom pick, uh, you mentioned him a little bit. Uh, Brian Robinson, I think they had him... Uh, what was it? Nine point three. It was it was under double digits. It's, Look, it's on the lower side. Yeah, I mean, oh, actually, frankly, up to ten point one now for uh, PPR scoring. Okay, so not bad. But you know, you look at just how bad, and I mean, the secondary is also guilty. But this has to do with is whatever the Packers defense as a whole has been very bad. Certainly to some degree against receivers, but also against running backs and just rushing attacks in general. I mean, whether you go over to Football Outsiders and check out their DVOA, you look at their complete inability to just stop rushing yards and all of that as well. Like, the the Packers are a bottom five unit. Some would fall into bottom ten. But either way, like, in, in most categories that matter, they're a bottom five run defense. They can easily go all over that. And all Brian Robinson really has to do to go over that total probably is like run with the efficiency he has been maybe catch a ball or two and he'll probably find a way to fall into the end zone yeah. this is going to be the way that they're going to have to beat the packers with tyler uh tyler taylor heineke under center with carson wentz out of the equation for the foreseeable future and then my bust pick i have pulled up here uh fun fact uh Chargers wide receiver Mike Williams is only capable of having under 20 receiving yards or over 100 in a game with absolutely oh no in between. That has happened. <laughs> One of those two things has happened in every game so far this year. If Keenan Allen does find a way to make it back onto the field, put his hamstring is- issues behind him, then perhaps... You know, Mike Williams could still be a pretty good play, but aggressively putting him at 17.6 in the PPR projections, I don't know, fantasy pros. I'm not feeling that good about it. I don't know. Maybe, like, look, the Seattle matchup is one that I write about in the waiver article and the waiver stashes article all the time. It's primo. It's one of the easiest things that you can do. Total cakewalk of the defense. Have at it. But, like I said, definition of boom bust to a very uncomfortable level and maybe Keenan Allen plays. So just some things to consider from my standpoint with my boom bust picks for week seven of the fantasy football season. Yeah, I I definitely get that. You know, the Seahawks haven't been the greatest defense overall. They're surprisingly stingy against wide receivers. According to fantasy pros, they are the 26th worst matchup for fantasy wide receivers. And given there's only 32 teams in the league, that is, um, this is not great. It's pretty wild. On the other hand, yes, with the boom bust nature of Mike Williams, 
you could definitely see him getting the 14.8 points he's projected for in basically one play. What do we say? Like 88 yard touchdown reception that would do it? I mean, mean, look. Oh, no, actually 78 because the PPR. Stranger things have happened, man. Um, And then Brian Robinson. I agree with the pick, obviously, as someone that I, you know, saying go ahead and start with confidence over David Montgomery, my bus pick. Uh, He had 60 yards and a touchdown last week. And boy, if that doesn't feel like what he'll do again this week. But yeah, that'll Mm -hmm. be good. Absolutely. 100%, man. And also just, I put this behind the paywall of the waiver article that I wrote most recently. Just if you're in a league, look, if you can't find the person that is the Antonio Gibson truther in your league, that means you are the Antonio Gibson truther. But if you find that person, immediately just try to get whatever you can, man. Like, Rivera yeah. don't give a shit. The commander's coaching staff, Scott Turner, they don't give a shit. He's yeah. not going to be able, like, this is the Robinson show. It's just, it's going to be, Robinson is going to be in the, you know, like, high, high-end RB3 discussion for the rest of the season, and who knows what the hell we're going to get out of Gibson. That's going to be my parting shot before we get into outros. That's the thing I really want people to remember. <laughs> no, I think there had been some talk of like him acknowledging that they need to get Antonio Gibson work. I will leave it when I see it, and I don't think we're going to see it. You know, if anything, he'll maybe replace J.D. McKissick's usage, but this is definitely Brian Robinson's job. Ain't that the damn truth? And, you know, we're just going to have to see how that works out. We're going to have to see how, I mean, maybe he could be a trade candidate. You never know. Christian McCaffrey, there's some rumblings about him as well. Those receivers that we talked about, all sorts of fun things. We got all the fun trade talk. We got all the fun under-the-radar sleeper wide receiver target talk out of the way. I thought this was a pretty good episode. I'm Sorry good. that we didn't get one out last week, folks, but you know it was worth the wait. It was worth the wait. Uh, so uh, do you want me to go ahead and sign out then? Uh, awkwardly oh, enough, this is the one thing we yeah. didn't have on the that's, show sheet. That's true. Yes. Oh, yes. We have to end the podcast. Okay. So we do. My um, name is. <laughs> real quick, I said I'd finish this beer during your dinner break, and uh, that, my friends, is mission accomplished. There it is. All right. Yeah. It's your boy McLateral, aka McLateral FF. On the Twitter, you can find me on Twitter at McLateral FF. You can also find me on Twitter at Mac McMillan ATL where I retweet and drop all my Tom's Guide stuff. That is my main Twitter profile. Uh, Tom's Guide to cover all the latest tech, all the latest gaming, all the latest entertainment. Oh, and I'm now also the one pushing out some of our How to Watch articles for uh, NFL games and English Premier League games. Oh. So keep an eye out for that stuff, even though I know you smart, you smart fantasy football players out there you already know where to watch all the NFL games. But if you happen to be into the other kind of football, you know, there's some EPL stuff there too. So definitely check it out. And uh, as always, you can find the Heat Check every Saturday on Fantasy Six Pack. It's a wonderful site. You should definitely sign up for one of those plans, which are over here off camera for me. Um, and that's it. That's really all I got. It's been a pretty smooth show. Uh, let's uh, let's go out with a bang. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's your boy, her. <laughs> You said go out with a bang, so I felt it was time to bring back the kazoo. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Herms NFL. That is my Twitter handle. That is where I tweet things and talk about fantasy football. Uh, I also talk about fantasy football in articles on fantasysixpack.net, uh, including something with a paywall thing. So for the, like, the third time, fantasysixpack.net. So you plans. should really get it. I mean, honestly, I mean, come on. There's so many things. So many things you get out of it. Uh, I also share some written work, like I said, over you know footballabsurdity.com. Got that article about Elijah Moore out. Pretty interesting if you want to read more about that. And then my day job, or I guess my night job, because I don't have the it's morning. Like it's 11.05. I don't have the morning shift. So, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, oh, uh, clutchpoints.com, if you are interested in you know my coverage of different NFL news over there, that is what I do. Also, yo, the company – originally started as a hub for basketball content huge in the nba concentration especially if you're a basketball fan definitely come check that out there's like hella good basketball content on the website as well so you know we'll see we'll see what else uh comes of different things in different areas and other i don't 
I don't know how to close the show. It's that. Mm, mm, mm. See, I was so close. It was so close to being a smooth transition. I mean, I think all you have to do is this.